All right, I think we're ready to go. Welcome everyone. Happy New Year, January 6, 2023. Welcome to the January meeting of the Memphis Astronomical Society. Uh, we got another, I think, great and practical program for you guys tonight, especially if you're interested in telescopes, as you can see up here. So we got a presentation that kind of give you a broad overview, followed by some hands-on, one-on-one mentoring if you'd like it. And I think we even have a chance to, to go out tonight with uh, somewhat clear skies before the rain comes in and snag the moon, full moon tonight, and uh, a couple of planets as well. So, you know, what we call our, the practical version of our Memphis Astronomical Society meeting. So, a few preliminaries and then I'll get telescope operator extraordinaire, Mr. Rick Honey up, who will uh, take over from there. So. First of all, we are, of course, the Memphis Astronomical Society. We're a nonprofit public service organization promoting interest in education, in astronomy, and related sciences. Learn more about us. You can find us online, memphisastro.org. That's our website. We're on social media also. We've got a Facebook group. If you haven't joined that group already, I'd highly recommend it. Got some great information there. And, of course, we have a YouTube channel, at Memphis Astron Society. We've hit 3,000 subscribers. So everybody watching, thank you for your participation and for continuing to visit our channel. And hopefully you get some more practical information tonight out of this meeting. So, and if you haven't already, take a minute to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Always gotta say that. What do they say? Hit that like button, smash that subscribe button, and hit the bell to be notified of updates or something, something along those lines. Not a YouTuber yet, so. Uh, if you go to our website and you want to be added to our email distribution list or join, all you got to do is click the join button and of course it'll bring up a separate form. You just fill out your details there. We'll add you to our email list and you'll receive weekly notices about anything we've got coming up, whether it's meetings or observing events or just anything in general. Welcome. They're rolling in. And if you are interested in outreach services from the Memphis Astronomical Society, we've got a form for that on our website as well. Just go to contact and uh, there's a drop down menu to schedule a talk and or presentation. We're doing more of this. We're probably going to be pretty busy this year. So we've got more outreach events from whether it's uh, schools or libraries or special interest groups. Just anybody in general who would like to request our services. So that's how you get a hold of us there. And we got a separate form that comes up. Just fill out your details. Again, the more details you give us, the better prepared we'll be to service your needs. Okay, new year and uh, calendar of events. Not a whole lot going on this month, but we've got a pretty active year coming up. And I'll show you some interesting things that are coming up here in just a second. But for the month of January, you know, we're all kind of recovering from the holiday hangover. I don't know about you, but I'm still taking down lights. It's almost over. Um, our next observing session will be on the 21st at Burton Sugar Farm, middle of the month. And I think that's the only dark sky observing session that we actually have scheduled for this month. And the day before on the 20th, we've got Strawberry Plains that's out in near Holly Springs. But I think that's just, is that a daytime? It's just a presentation by one of our members. Okay, it's just a presentation, so no observing. But on the 26th, that Thursday, we just added it today. Um, Shelby Forest, a little public school up there, E.E. Jeter Elementary. Oh, Jeter, okay. Jeter was added on the 26th. Is that right? Yep. 26th of January? Where's a laser pointer? Okay, so that's Thursday night, last Thursday of the month, Jeter Elementary. They're near Shelby Forest. They have a space week every year. And they have a nice place where you can set up and I think they do bonfire and hot dogs and marshmallows and then kids running around. So it's kind of a a mixture of uh, you know star party space week and then also observing so we always need telescopes for for that event so if you can make it out that's Thursday January 26th we'll get this added to our calendar I guess it was just added now by the outreach team so that's another observing event that we've got coming up later this month so mark your calendars if you can come out last year we had some really good participation it's always a fun event so and we had plenty of telescopes last year, so hopefully we'll get, get more participation this year. So, yeah, that's the following Thursday, last Thursday of the month. And we actually have a comet now. I just, I just received word of this, too. We've got a new comet that's coming into view. So it's really low on the horizon. Okay. Yeah, Brian and I are waiting for the clouds to clear and get more favorable conditions, and then 
we'll get out and do our customary January comet observing. So um, if we get more information on that, we'll send it out. So that's what we got going on this month. Um, all right, I'll talk about the rest of the year later, but before we do, I want to recognize some new members, if I haven't already. Mylan, I don't know if I've acknowledged you yet, but you're actually not only a new member, but a new board member. Say hello to Mylan, welcome. <laughs> Approved December 1, and he actually showed up to the meeting, so he broke the tradition. That's okay. <laughs> And Cooper is here, probably our youngest member. He was approved maybe four months ago or so. Oh, Cooper. Welcome. Everybody say hello to Cooper, one of our new members. Excellent. Norm Gilbert, um, you were at the last meeting. Don't think you're here tonight, but welcome, Norm. Cameron Caldwell, I don't think he's here either. Welcome, Cameron. You've been active on our, on our Facebook page for quite a while with astrophotography. We do have an unwritten rule. If you have the last name Messier, Caldwell, Galileo, Newton, you're automatically approved. So this was an easy one. Still got to pay. Yeah, you still got to pay though. Yeah, you got to pay your dues. See our treasurer for that. Uh, Ryan Westcott, are you here? Ryan, welcome. And I believe he's that's on it. Zoom. Oh, he's on Zoom. Hello. Yes. All right. <laughs> We got a uh, message from Zoom. Welcome everybody on, for our, to our Zoom audience. Ryan, you're on Zoom. We're all giving you yeah. an applause. <laughs> Welcome to the Memphis Astronomical Society. Approved, just Thank approved you. actually, January 4. So maybe we'll see you in person next month. Or one of, uh, come to one of our outreach or observing sessions and we'll, we'll let it slide that you weren't here tonight. That's, that's the bigger picture. Anyway, welcome to all our new members. And of course, if you're a subscribing member, you get access to our newsletter, The Meteorite. Be sure you check out this month's edition. And Happy New Year. Okay, also, if, if, you're, if you wanna be more, if, another way you can engage with us is through our Slack channel. And we have a link here, and we'll email this out as well as post it. And um, in, in fact, I think we sent an email notice out recently with this link is that correct it is out okay so if you're on our email list you should have gotten this email with the link to our slack channel uh members only members That's just to the members members, members. Okay. members only is what we all right know. we're figuring this out okay if you are a member another way that you can engage with us is through the mas slack site we sent an email out with this link and slack is something we've been using a little bit more regularly for communication we do it with the board the astrophotography group meeting and actually, Ann has kind of spearheaded this effort. And Ann, I think you have a minute to just kind of tell people a little bit about this. Sure. You can take more than a minute if you want. Okay. I actually left it up here. Okay. Let me take my microphone my off. This way I can, uh, I can capture the audio here. Okay. So if you've never used Slack before, it's just an online sort of message board where you can talk to other people with same interests kind of in real time. I can post a question and someone, you know, maybe an hour later is gonna answer and then someone else will chime in. So it's a way to keep us talking with one another between meetings. And our, um, we have a couple of sites. I'll go to our, uh, this is the one for the Memphis Astronomical Society. And so the name of the channel is up here, Memphis Astronomical Society. And then on the left, you have all these different channels. So I don't know if you can read those up there, but we have a channel for just general discussions. And the last few days, we've been talking about Edwin Hubble and posting pictures, you know, just keep talking about things that come up in the news. We have a channel just for talking about telescopes and equipment because there are always questions. So you can post a question here. Patrick was asking, how do I clean a filter? And, I chimed in, I don't think it's hard, you can buy this, but Rick is the expert and he chimed in how he does it. So it's a way to get advice kind of in real time. You, know, you had a problem last night and you want to fix it before tonight. So you can just post to the appropriate channel. We always post about the upcoming meetings. We've been moving around to different rooms and different locations recently. So this is a way to stay updated on where the meeting is going to be held. And we're hoping to be here for a little while anyway. Um, and the observing events is a really active channel. Like we just announced tonight, we're gonna be observing up in Shelby Forest. So the week of that event, we'll start talking about, you know, who's bringing what scope and who's gonna be there for sure. 
uh, how's the weather looking, and all the updates will be posted here kind of in real time so you don't have to open your email, look through 50 emails to find one relating to this topic. It'll be right there in the channel. So that's for the Memphis Astronomical Society. We also have a really active um, astrophotography group, and it's the same kind of thing. We have different channels. Um, we're kind of doing a, a competition right now where we're editing some uh, data. Um, and so th this has been a really active channel. And so it might get too active, so you want to turn off notifications. So I don't want to tell you how to do that. If, if the channel is, is dinging your phone or your iPad or your iWatch too often, you just go to the channel that is driving you crazy, and up here you say notifications. Well, I don't, I don't want to enable notifications, but you'll be able to s turn on and off notifications for a, a an individual channel. Um, it can be annoying, especially if you're in a meeting and your phone keeps flashing as 50 people are talking on Slack. So you can also set yourself as a way over here on the upper right. You choose and just say set yourself as a way or pause notifications for, you know, until tomorrow or for two hours or whatever. Just wanted you to be aware of that. But I encourage you to join the, the Memphis Astronomical Society Slack channel. Um, it, it gets really busy at times when exciting things happen in the news or when the James Webb was getting its first data. It's a really exciting way to keep us talking to one another and you get to know people through the channel and you come to the meeting and you finally get to meet them and it just really fosters us uh, being a community group. So that's all I wanted to say. Excellent. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Oh, for those of you who are here, the restrooms in this building, you go ah. down to the double doors where you probably came in, kind of hang a right, there will be a sign that says elevators and it's kind of back around the corner. But you just go down the hallway and it's sort of to the right. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, it took me about 10 minutes to find it actually. See? Mm -hmm. All the way down and to the right and that's where they, that's where they are. But you get a nice tour of the building. So, Okay, so again, if you remember, you've gotten the link to, put this microphone back on, to the Slack channel. And I just lost my clicker. There it is. So yeah, another way you can, you can engage with us. OK, um, speaking of events, we uh, have an interesting year coming up. So I wanted to take just a minute to give you an idea of what we've got coming up in the year 2023, highlight a couple of things. And uh, that way you can be preparing ahead of time. So programming wise, we're looking pretty good right now. We're basically booked out until mid year. So uh, we've got maybe a slot or two open between now and then. Second half of the year, things start to get a little interesting. So I just want to point these things out so that uh, you can kind of be anticipating what's coming. Uh, first of all, we have the 100th year anniversary of a major event in the history of astronomy. And that is Edwin Hubble making the measurement to the Andromeda Nebula at that time and proving that it's not a nebula, it's actually a, a separate island universe or galaxy outside of the Milky Way. And that's going to be occurring. The, the paper was published in 1925 and I don't think it actually uh, went public until later in the decade, but the actual measurement was made on October the 6th, 1923. So Freddie, I know you're on virtually, kind of be making a mental note, we need to have a program for this <laughs> second half of the year. Yours truly would volunteer for this if no one else would, but I do have someone else in mind, I'm not gonna mention any names, who might be a better candidate, Ann Viano, be a good uh, presentation on this. But whoever does it, um, this could be a, a very interesting talk. I was just thinking the other day, wouldn't it be cool to actually go to Southern California and book time at the 100 inch Hooker telescope at Mount Wilson and look through that telescope in October of this year the 100th anniversary of this discovery. So Edwin Hubble, by measuring the distance to the Andromeda galaxy and basically solving a two to 300 year debate about the nature of the spiral nebulae, proved that the Milky Way wasn't the only galaxy in the universe, that there's basically hundreds of billions of them. So effective, effectively, he expanded the scale of the universe by a, a factor of 100 billion overnight and uh, our perception of the universe has never been the same again. So very exciting. And that will be coming up this year in the second half. So now the second event that we've got, this is an, an astronomical event. We've got an annular solar eclipse. So anybody remember the last solar eclipse that we had a few years ago? 
that wasn't an annual. It wasn't an annual, that was a total. So second half of this year going into next year, we got to start getting solar eclipse fever again. So obviously next year, April the 8th, 2024, we've got another solar eclipse. I know that's, you know, people are thinking it's over a year away, I don't have to worry about it. Now's the time to start thinking about it, to start planning where you're going to be, what your contingency plan is, and you know, start at least be thinking ahead of time. The path of totality for the 2024 eclipse is very different than the one for 2017. And I, I don't know if anybody was uh, in attendance for the December meeting, but Kent Martz kind of talked about this, where the path of totality for the 17 was basically parallel to the highways. Not going to be the same in 24. It's going to be you know, perpendicular to the major interstates. So, and April tends to be a more cloudy month than, and then August. So um, don't be, don't assume that wherever you're planning to go for April 8, 2024 is gonna be clear. You gotta be, be prepared to move as we figured out. But anyway, before that, um, we have this event on October the 14th, 2023. And of course, an annular is when the moon is further out in its orbit from Earth, so it doesn't completely cover the disk of the sun. It covers most of it and it forms an annulus or a ring. So if you're interested in this, you've got to get into this narrow band right here, which is basically in South Texas. And uh, Midland, I think there's an event here. Don just informed me, not don't go to Albuquerque because he just got back from Albuquerque. Don, if you go to Albuquerque, I want to know because I'm not going because I know you're going to bring clouds with you. But um, it, if you're willing to travel in mid-October, this could be an interesting event. It's on a Saturday. It's typically fall break. You got young kids, you know, maybe skip Disneyland this year and take them to an annular eclipse. And if you, for those of you who saw our December meeting, or if you haven't, you want to watch it again, it's on YouTube. Kent Martz had some interesting things to say. I think Explore Scientific has an event coming up. And this is right around the time also of the El Dorado Star Party. So. If you're thinking of fall plans, October's a nice month to travel. Might want to think about checking this one out. Again, you got to get to South Texas. And third, assuming we stay around long enough, the Memphis Astronomical Society will be celebrating its 70th anniversary this year, second half of the year. So this image was published a couple years ago in, uh, in the Commercial Appeal, and this is where it all began. Basically, these three individuals right here in the backyard of, their, of one of their homes observing the Perseid meteor, meteor shower in August of 1953. This individual right here is basically the founder. That's John Bueller. And sadly, he passed away a couple years ago. But um, it started here. And basically, 70 years later, we're, uh, we're going to be celebrating the, the, the seventh decade of the, of the existence of the Memphis Astronomical Society. And we had the opportunity last month to open the, the uh, safety deposit box at the bank and hold the original charter for the document when the society was formed back in 1953. Now, I can't read all this, but there's some interesting, interesting things that talk about basically, you know, why we're here, why we exist and what our purpose is. And the board has been very active in getting under the hood of this and kind of getting back to the original purpose of the existence of our society. And several of our board members have, have been very busy. We've been very busy kind of looking into things and how we can improve our processes, do a better job of interacting and communicating with our membership, as well as uh, our community as a whole. So that's gonna be a, a primary focus going forward as we get into this year. So anyway. Some exciting things coming up, prim primarily the second half of the year. And that leads me to this. I'm always looking for people to serve on teams, new teams that we're forming. So if you're a member and you have time and you're willing to get more active in our community, then we certainly would be interested in your services. The board is, you know, we got a board of 10 people that pr primarily does the lion's share of the work, but. A lot of us are still employed full time. We have either businesses or jobs. Some of us are retired, which is nice, but a lot of us are still really busy. It's a volunteer organization. And if we want to stay around, you know, for another seven decades, then we, we, we need people to continue to stay involved and contribute. 
the, um, the outreach effort has been fantastic over the last uh, couple of years, especially. So. Especially younger people. Yeah, especially younger people, right? Yeah. That's, well, yeah, that's another discussion for another time, but uh, there's kind of this passing down of the, of the knowledge as well as the effort. But I kind of outlined this a few meetings ago, a few or several months back, kind of the six, te uh, six teams primarily. And this is constantly evolving. I mean, we, had, we have board members, people bring this up to my attention, and then you know, one team forms, maybe we form another team or, or, or something else comes up. But anyway, um, like I said, outreach, I think we can pretty much cross this off. We've got an outreach team right now that's really been very active and I think done a great job of, of getting us engaged. But of course, we always need people with telescopes. One of the reasons that we have a meeting like tonight is so that you can get some more familiarity and then eventually get assimilated into the collective and become what's called a competent telescope operator. In other words, we can use you at a future outreach event. But anyway, um, finance we can cross off too. Um, we we got a new treasurer now who is retired. He's got a little bit more time. We have a budget this year now. So we're gonna be following this budget more closely. And I need to highlight this because if you're considering becoming a member or if you are a paying member, your membership dues are important for our society. We do have expenses. You know, this room tonight was not for free. We have a website, we have other back-end tools. Everything costs money and uh, Merrill has been really spearheading this and kind of keeping us in line now that we need to stick to our budget. So if you're a paying member, thank you. We need membership dues. If you're considering becoming a member, please, by all means, um, sign up. Your membership dues help keep our society going and revenue really helps us do other things that can hopefully add more value to you as a, as a membership base. So that's, but the bottom line is the budget is going to drive our decisions going forward. How we function and how we act, interact as a society. So if it's within the budget, we'll do it. If not, then we have to make some decisions, some strategic decisions about, you know, what we implement and what we don't. So it's important to have memberships, and you know, we we can do other things like fundraising as well and uh, donations as well. But that's not as consistent, obviously, as membership. So your membership dues are important. Uh, programming, I think we're in a good position there. These other three teams, um, comms will be will will be forming this team soon. And that's basically, well, a, ba a better way of communicating with our community as a whole. That's, com that's communications. Um, Team Borg, I'm particularly excited about. And again, that's, I could call this, you know, telescope mentoring or something else, but I'm looking for something a little bit more creative other than just a committee or telescope mentoring. And again, if you're interested in getting a telescope or if you've got one and need some help using it, the payoff for us is when we have another Village Creek Star Party or we have another event at Bobby Lanier, we have another person who can bring out a telescope to really help us out with this. So our goal here is to assimilate you into the collective and get as many what I call competent telescope operators as we can. So that's the selfish motive on our end for why we have a meeting like tonight. Uh, somebody else came up with this name too, Light Bucket Brigade. That might be a more creative name. Kind of like that since i'm a dobsonian guy all this go-to stuff i really don't have any use for it but anyway everybody uh, yeah i like that so anyway um bottom line is we're going to be really focusing on membership this year and how we can do a better job as a society of adding value to our membership so that's kind of our our uh our focus going forward and Speaking of membership communications, I want to bring this to everybody's attention too. We do have a survey on our website now. And so if you're a member, just go to members, member survey, several questions on there. We want to hear from you. We haven't really done as good a job maybe of reaching out to our membership and getting feedback from you about what you want to get out of this society. So if you want to give us feedback, um, we'll, certainly, we'll certainly listen. So just go to this member survey if you're interested. Let us know what you want, what we, what we can do as far as programming, as far as just anything as a society to um, help you get more value 
out of uh, the Memphis Astronomical Society. So there's a survey on there. We're old. Change hurts. What's it? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but bring it on. Bring it on. Okay. A couple other things, then I'll get Rick up here. Uh, last month we, we had the splashdown of Artemis and it occurred on the same day as the 50th anniversary of Apollo 17 touching down on the moon, which is the last Apollo mission to uh, put human beings on the surface of the moon. Bill Wepner is one of our members. He's also a former NASA flight controller. And I had the opportunity to interview two of his former colleagues, John Aaron and Jim Kelly, who played an instrumental role in saving Apollo 12 and Apollo 13. If you saw the movie Apollo 13, uh, they were basically their role was featured in that film, Ecom. So if you're interested, check that out. The replay is on our YouTube channel. Very, very interesting conversation. We got this generation of people now, sadly, that are getting older and eventually passing on, and they put men on the moon. I mean, just, it's just an incredible thing to think about. You know, human beings setting foot on another celestial body. You know, in my lifetime, that hasn't happened. Now with Artemis, we're taking steps to go back. So we've had this successful unmanned mission. Hopefully future missions will, will follow, but just the fact that we've been there is just, for me personally anyway, just really incredibly fascinating. So, and hear these guys talk, it's like stepping back in time. So again, if you're interested in this piece of history, check it out on our YouTube channel. Uh, lastly, we have an astrophotography focus group that meets once a month, January 18th is our next meeting. So if you're interested, check that out. Uh, there's a form on our website also you can fill out to give us more feedback. Anything to add? We're, we're, the, the project we're taking on right now is to uh, process some data and submit it to a national work, is it, the, the Astro Imaging Channel. We hope we're going to win. Win. <laughs> we're, yeah, there's a lot of excitement doing this. Oh, okay. I mean, Excellent. In the members. It's just it's pretty spectacular. Processing data and submitting it to yeah, they, a... They provide the data that actually an astronomer, uh, astrophotographer in Australia provided. Yeah. So we're processing it individually, then we're going to meet on the 18th to make our best shot at the Excellent. final product. It's going to be cool. It already is cool. Yeah. And it's an essential skill if you're an astrophotographer, too, getting good at image processing, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. That's kind of the key piece. So working on a critical skill and submitting it to a, a national um, organization, national website. So yeah. And you can jump in any time. You don't, need, you don't need to have any background. Just jump in, join the conversation, hang out with these guys. And be, be a member you. first, though. <laughs> yeah, be a member first. OK. <laughs> you got to be a member first. All right. And, and, and if you're taking pictures with your cell phone through the eyepiece, that counts. OK, that counts. Yeah. Got a mark? Sure. That's, that's my version of, here's my version of astrophotography. Oh, this is really cool. I want to catch a picture here of, of the moon. I'll be quite honest, like I've been steady. amazed at some of the results. You know? It's amazing what you can do with your iPhone now. So start there. You know, you don't need a fancy schmancy uh, DSLR or whatever, the other kind of cameras you guys use. Oh, those, those are cool too. Um, previous meetings are on our YouTube channel also. So if you want to watch those and catch up, you can. But anyway. January 18, 7 o'clock, we will send out an email notice and an agenda with that meeting. We're ready, but we'll do it again. There you go. <laughs> you guys have taken over the list, so it's getting better now, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, nice, it's nice when you're president of an organization, you get relieved of duties on something. It's like, okay, I'm fired now. I can go over here and work on this. So, excellent. All right. Okay, Happy New Year. We do this every year, January. Some of you brought out your telescopes tonight, and this is just kind of a practical, hands-on meeting. Uh, telescopes can be great, but it's also a journey. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my buddy Rick, who's gonna tell you about the joys and the frustrations and sorrows of new telescope ownership. And I'll give you my microphone here. here. I'm going to start back here. So let me put this camera back where it was. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so uh, welcome. My name's Rick Honey. I've been um, dabbling in the telescope uh, hobby since 1990. Well, I actually started in the mid 80s. It was my first telescope. And uh, got serious about it in the early 90s when I heard about a comet that was going to crash into Jupiter. And, uh, and that, that said, I needed to figure out how to use that telescope I bought in the mid 80s. Because <laughs> what little I had done with it hadn't uh, resulted in a result that I liked that I thought was worth it. So we'll get started here. What, it, uh, what I want to do is make sure you don't wind up like this. And I love, I love these scenes you'll see on TV. Once you know about telescopes, and, and you start to figure some of this stuff out, you'll see a TV, a scene on a TV show where they've got a telescope, especially something like a Newtonian telescope here, pointed in exactly the wrong direction because this is where the eyepiece is, it, the light it should be coming in this end down here. Uh, this is uh, just all wrong. And of course, you don't have a light shining in your eyes to you so you can do it. But, you know, for a TV commercial about uh, pizza, uh, probably uh, they meant well, I'm sure. <laughs> so what I'd like to cover is go over some, some basics um, about telescopes, a few of the basic types of telescopes, uh, a couple of basic mounts, or how you move telescopes, and there's really only two then uh, some discussion about how to find things, and then some more discussion about why you should keep trying even if you're disappointed with your first attempt at viewing something. There are, the, the universe is out to spoil your efforts. And uh, <laughs> you, if you, when you get things just right on the right night with the right weather conditions and the right everything else, and you see those bands on Jupiter come f very sharp for just a brief moment and you go, wow, okay, it's worth it. Uh, so we're going to start with telescope mount, I mean telescope types. There's essentially only two. Uh, there are refractors and then there are reflectors. And then there are reflectors with some corrective lensing, refractive uh, components. But uh, the things, what I want to talk about are some of the problems that occur with all of these. And most of them that occur with this reflector will occur with this, uh, this is called a catadioptric. Well, they call it a compound. I'm not sure what that really meant. But it's got both uh, lenses and ref uh, mirrors. There are essentially two kinds of mounts. An altitude azimuth mount, it basically just like this and point back and forth and that's the only two ways it moves. And uh, you, you can find things on charts without the, out as coordinates. It'll tell you the compass heading that the telescope should be pointed at and the altitude to raise it to in, in the angular, uh, angular degrees. The other one is a uh, equatorial mount, and this mount is designed to allow you to move the telescope in only one axis to try to track something that's moving across the sky. And if you hadn't figured out yet that when you go out at night, things aren't just sitting there all night in the same place. Uh, and they're not moving, the Earth is. And what happens is Earth is rotating and that stuff will go zooming across the sky. You'll get your telescope finally pointed at something for a minute, and a minute or later, it's gone. And you go, where did it go? And with an equatorial mount, you only have to move it in one direction to keep up. And if you've got a clock drive on it, it'll keep up with itself. So we'll talk some more about that. Refractor telescopes. There are a whole lot of inexpensive ones out there. They come in long focal length and short focal length. Focal length is a thing you're going to want to understand more about as you learn telescopes. That has a lot to do with the field of view, 
or the magnification uh, of what you're trying to look at. Long focal length telescopes have got a very narrow field of view. They're going to be good for things like planets and bright objects in our own solar system. While short focal length telescopes are going to have a wide field of view, they'll capture more light, they'll give you better resolution, and they're better for sh uh, faint fuzzy things. But they won't have quite the magnification. The images will be smaller. Um, spotting scopes and binoculars are also a refractor type of of design. These have prisms in them so they fold the optics around to make the telescopes a little shorter and uh, that's, that's that. This is the world's largest refractor telescope. It turns out that when you're trying to make magnifying glasses and you get to the 40 inch mark, the center of the lens is so thick that the edges of the lens can't really support it well and it's and the whole thing starts to droop in t with time. This is the 40 inch uh, refractor at Yerkes. I think they had to make that lens twice before they got it right and then uh, they never tried to build anything bigger than that. This is a, a really neat picture I found on the internet with uh, a rather famous uh, physicist here uh, Dr. Albert Einstein in front of the Yerkes 40 inch refractor and, and its early conf, uh, configuration. You see they didn't have a lot of automation back then and you see these long rods are, are control handles that control things up here at the mount. Uh, just fascinating piece of hardware. A very large clock drive right ascension and declination. This, this stuff has got to be fun to work on. That's all I got to say. <clears throat> so, another type of telescopes are refractors and they are, uh, I mean, yeah, refract, I'm sorry. The two, the two primary types of refractor telescopes you will find are Acromat and Apoc and and uh, apochromatic. And basically it amounts to color uh, problems. So there's a, there's an, a uh, I'll talk some tonight about aberrations. These are optical effects that occur in telescopes that aren't good, right? So in, in refractor telescopes you can get chromatic aberration, basically various colors in the color spectrum don't come to focus at the same point and it takes uh, some tricks to get it to, to overcome that. You can get an apochromatic, uh, APO, uh, apochromatic uh, uh, performance out of a two lens uh, telescope these days. They have something now called very low dispersion glass that allows them to do this. So this isn't um, set in stone, but typically an achromatic telescope will have two objective lenses. There'll be two elements up here at the objective ends of the telescope. While the much more expensive and uh, more color correct versions will have three lenses up here. The difference between, in cost between this telescope and this one is thousands of dollars. This is the effect of uh, chromatic aberration. Basically a lens, you know that uh, refraction is how light bends as it goes through glass and the light at uh, the higher the frequency, the sharper the light bends. So it, uh, kind of blue comes to a focus here, green here, red here, and when you're trying to look at that or record it on film, it just uh, makes a mess. And this is really the kind of thing it looks like. Well, this picture is very sharp and clear. This one appears blurry. You don't really see well, you kind of get a hint of the color issues, but it's just blurry. And so 
if this was a bright star um, and a very short focal length uh, Acromat telescope, you would get, you would actually see the different colors. You'll see a bright star with maybe a red ring around it or something. And uh, it'll always create halos. Uh, the next type of telescope I want to talk about uses mirrors. And the primary reason for this was to get away from the glass. They, they found out what the limit was they could build with glass, uh, with lenses, and started using mirrors. Uh, a fellow named Newton figured this out, and uh, he uh, uh, started building telescopes with mirrors. So you only had one side of the glass to finish. You didn't have to finish both sides of it. We have some very famous, in fact, almost all large professional telescopes are a reflector telescope of one design or another. We, of course, have the Hubble, which was the world's greatest reflector telescope for many years. We now have the James Webb. This is not a visible light telescope. This one is designed to work in the infrared uh, range of the optical spectrum, which is why the mirror is gold. Uh, uh, infrared is more uh, thoroughly reflected with a, with a gold surface. Um, this is a, a, a Newtonian reflector telescope in a Dobsonian mount. And that's this kind of telescope we have up here, the black one. They're typically referred to as a Dob or a Dobson. Uh, a fellow named John Dobson uh, started doing sidewalk astronomy in, in San Francisco decades ago, and these are easy to build. Uh, he had people, he had classes, he had workshops where people made their own mirrors, put their uh, telescopes together, made Dobsonian mounts, and went out and shared the night sky with the people of San Francisco. The mount became so popular that it's named after him. Uh, yeah. There's something that's interesting. Before the Dobbs Ovian, we didn't have any fish holes. Most people had six, most of them had eight. Oh, yeah, yeah. When the Dobbs Ovian came out, it really was like that. Richard makes a good point. This is a, uh, this is a 10 inch uh, Dobb. Um, to put that on an equatorial mount, the mount it becomes as much expense as the telescope was to make. So this allows you to have a really inexpensive mount and put most of your money into the telescope itself. So you can have larger telescopes. Uh, I, what is this? This is probably about 700, I think. I, I don't know, but uh, a 10 inch daub is, is affordable these days. Uh, this is a uh, Cassegrain telescope. This is a reflector. Uh, this is uh, this. Uh, this was the second telescope I ever bought. Um, one of the things, if you haven't bought a telescope yet and you're looking into it, one of the things you might find yourself trying to figure out is long focal length telescopes great for planets. Short focal length telescopes great for what we call the faint fuzzies. Uh, you know, why have I got to choose? Uh, I wanted a telescope that would do both. Well, back in the day, uh, a company called Parks made one that had a cast grain mode and with the swap of a secondary mirror would change to a Newtonian design. So it was an F13 cast grain or an F3.5 Newtonian. It was a wonderful telescope. I'll tell a story about that in a minute. This is a uh, Dobsonian telescope like this, but this is at least a 12 inch. And as they get bigger, you have a truss tube to keep the weight down so that this thing starts to get big and heavy as it gets bigger. And this becomes a much more transportable telescope if, when, you've got, when you can take it apart and reassemble it uh, on site. So in the, new, in the reflector range, you have the Newtonian design, and then you have Cassegrain's. And 
the cast grains come in several flavors. Uh, there's and it, basically anything where the focuser is on the back end of the telescope, where the light's focused back through a hole in the center of the primary mirror, is essentially a Cassegrain of sorts. Uh, there's the classical Cassegrain. There's one called, this one uses uh, spherical mirrors and is subject to uh, a, an aberration called coma. Uh, there's one called Ritchie Cretion. This one uses hyperbolic uh, mirrors and eliminates a lot of the coma. And then a doll Kirkham. Um, I forget what the what the special effects are of that, but it's uh, another one of the cast of grain modes. So it's a flat field. What? Flat field. Flat field of view. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so the Newtonian. Uh, design light comes in there's a primary mirror comes back the light cone is then reflected out of the path of view into an eyepiece by a diagonal mirror or secondary Cassegrain does something similar except the, the secondary mirror is not flat it'll be some kind of spherical shape and it'll focus the light back through the center of the primary mirror all of the reflector telescopes can suffer from the image effects of central obstruction. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure this picture really gets that across. Uh, this is not quite as sharp as this is. I have a Ritchie Cretion telescope, uh, an 8 inch. It is designed specifically for astrophotography as a visual telescope it's really horrible <laughs> and which is really sad because it was really expensive and and i thought well okay but it can't be that bad right no it's that bad uh, 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 uh astronomy i mean astrophotography it's wonderful flat field great sharpness all the way to the edges uh, uh but you put an eyepiece in it and you go ah uh, no it's not worth it so I haven't had an eyepiece in that one in years now. So the camera stays connected to it. Um, and in other telescopes, it's still there. Cassegrains and, and what have you. It's not bad in, my ca in most Cassegrains. They are designed for visual use. So coma is another aberration that occurs. And that's due to the fact that uh, the field isn't flat, it's bouncing off of curved surfaces and it, with spherical mirror grind, with spherical mirrors getting everything in focus at the same time all the way out to the edge of the field of view is n nearly impossible. In fact, what the coma looks like, and you see how these look like little comets, kind of, sort of? Uh, what you'll find is that all of these will, as they point back to the center of the telescope, so if you have all of these out around the edge, they'll all be pointed back toward the center of the telescope. You can correct coma with uh, some uh, lenses introduced into the system and what have you, and that becomes a different kind of telescope. Diffraction spikes. So these little cute little uh, spikes around the stars are due to the uh, thing, the, the spider that holds the secondary mirror in place. Diffraction spikes occur exactly opposite of the, uh, the cross. So if you had a single uh, bar, going across uh, holding your telescope, holding your secondary in place. So in here you can see it uses two uh, uh, flat bars to hold the secondary mirror in place. So you're going to get the classic uh, cross of, of spikes. If you only had one bar going across here, like my 13 inch daub does, you get one spike, but it's opposite the direction of the bar. It's 90 degrees perpendicular to it, which is odd. <laughs> and you can see in that telescope, 
that there's a, this is a Schmidt Cassegrain, and the, you don't get the fraction spikes in that because the secondary mirror is held in place by clear meniscus uh, glass lens in the front. Thank you, Ann. Now, if you don't have any of that, and you still like the looks of those diffraction spikes in your images after you take pictures, you can add them back with a little program that uh, Merrill has that uh, does that quite nicely. <coughs> then the other thing that kills, uh, that kills new observers, and in, in they either are genuinely collimation problems or everything is blamed as a collimation problem. Um, that's not always the case and uh, collimation can be uh, a little tricky to learn um, but it's it's something that can be done actually these days we with lasers and stuff uh, they've gotten a whole lot easier to be able to collimate. Uh, this kind of telescope like this Newtonian Dob um, you might need to cal check the collimation every time you take it out someplace and set it up. Collimation in something like that Schmidt Cassegrain over there is pretty rigid and doesn't need to be tested too often, but uh, can get out as well. So these are the two different types of popular catadioptric telescopes. This is a Schmidt Cassegrain, much like this one here. And then this one's called a Maksutov. Uh, Cassegrain and it uh, it does something essentially different. This is um, a, what's called a meniscus lens and it's you can't really see it here but the design of it is not anything like the, what they use in a Maksutov. In this uh, kind of uh, configuration it's just a spot in the middle of this lens on the front of this thing that's been mirrored to reflect back through the center of the telescope. And these things are uh, generally pretty nice, uh, generally pretty sharp views. They don't get very big, um, but uh, you, can, you can get a six, eight inch Maksutov that uh, will produce excellent views. Uh, same way with Schmidt Cassegrain. Now these are typically long focal length. That's the other benefit of a, of a reflector design is that you can get longer focal length in a shorter package by folding the optics. So these, this is typically an F10, a focal ratio of F10. Uh, I have this telescope at home and it's a F15. So uh, they, they can get rather uh, high magnification. This is good for planets. All right. So I, I spent years doing these. Uh, back years ago, we used to do one in December about, well, if you think you want to buy a telescope for Christmas, here's the things to think about. Then in January, we'd do our, so you got a new telescope for Christmas program, and we'd do that. And I used to tell people all the time, you know, learn from my mistakes. You know, nobody, but nobody learn from my mistakes. <laughs> so, I, so it caused me to rethink my story a little bit and say, well, you know, truth of the matter is, I don't regret anything I've ever done relative to telescopes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, and I can't even honestly say I wasted money on any of them. You know, if you a lot of these, if you, if you buy decent equipment, you can get a decent price for it when you sell it, if you decide you don't want it. I have a hard time with that deciding I don't want it thing, but uh, so I've got a whole garage full of stuff that doesn't get used as much. My only fear is that uh, when I die, my wife sells it off for what I told her I paid for it. <laughs> so, uh, my very first telescope was a Tasco four and a half inch, uh, what we used to call a dime store uh, thing. I think I bought this at Sears and Roebuck. Uh, I thought it was horrible then. 
I look back on it now and I think it really wasn't that bad for four and a half inch and for what I paid for it. Um, this mount, this equatorial mount, messed me up. I could for the life of me, just the whole uh, concept did not set with me for a long time. I, it was, I, I don't get it, you know. Um, and so with no help, there, I didn't know anything about a Memphis Astronomical Society back then. And uh, no other way to figure it out. After looking at the moon a half dozen times and not, able to, not being able to find much anything else with it, it went into the attic. Fortunately, it's small and light weight enough it could go in the attic. Um, lesson learned, get a better telescope. <laughs> so, in my normal <laughs> mode of approaching <laughs> problem solving, I'll go from one extreme to another. Uh, I started studying telescopes. I told you this uh, comet was going to crash into Jupiter. And I thought, well, I've got a year to figure out. And I started by getting my Tesco out and trying to look at Jupiter and see if it would do the job. I bought a couple of more eyepieces for it. It had the .96 inch eyepieces. There weren't anything in, any good there. And I realized pretty quickly it just wasn't going to do the job. But uh, so I started buying Sky and Telescope magazine and started looking at the ads and what have you. And it, I kind of figured out at some point about the focal length thing. You either buy a short focal length telescope or a long focal length telescope. Well, this is a planet, so I want something that'll do long focal length, right? Well, it turns out of all the telescopes advertised in those magazines, only Parks had what was called their hybrid imaging technology, Cassegrain slash Newtonian. It was an F-13 Cassegrain looking through this back focuser there's an F3.5, a Newtonian, looking through the side of it like that with a, by changing the secondary mirror, and that's all it took. So they didn't advertise prices in the magazine, so I wrote to Parks and got a price sheet back from them, and this baby was $8,000. And I said, okay, not in this lifetime, but uh, we'll see. And back in the day, I was an uh, engineer for FedEx and worked out at the airport. And uh, uh, there, was a, there were a whole lot of pawn shops. Well, there, actually, the Sears Outlet store, for one, was over there on, uh, uh, oh gosh, what was the name of that road? Anyway, uh, so I shopped there a lot for tools and stuff. And every now and then, I'd hit the, out, the uh, pawn shops for some tool or something. And so I, walk, I walked into a pawn shop on Lamar one afternoon and set up in the middle of the store was this telescope. And, and I'm sitting there going, whoa, this is so out of place, you know? And the little boy inside of me is jumping up and down going, yay, oh my God, this is so exciting. And I looked, up to, looked at one of the guys waiting there and I said, what's this? <laughs> Not wanting to give away that I knew exactly what it was. They said, we don't know. It belongs to the guy that owns the bug exterminating company next door. So I walked next door and talked to him for a little bit. And after a little negotiating, I bought this telescope, uh, an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain, a handful of other stuff, and a trailer to, put, to, to load it all up in for $2,000. And uh, this telescope I used for many years. It was heavy. It took at least an hour to set up. Uh, it was a beast, but the optics, the optics at first were horrible because the guy that you owned it before would take it apart to transport it. He would take the mirror cell out of the back of the thing to transport it. He would do all kinds of stuff that if you know about telescopes, you know not to do that. <laughs> And, uh, and, and in fact, these things were so hard to deal with that every time I'd call park, Parks for some technical support, their response was, just pack it up and send it back to us and we'll fix it and send it back to you. Well, that's, uh, it was 45 pounds. I wasn't gonna do that. Anyway, 
After about 80 hours of work, I became quite familiar and really quite good at collimating telescopes and collimating optics. There's a few concepts there you got to get around, get your head around. Uh, aligning optical centers, not mechanical centers, uh, is one, and and you just a whole lot of stuff to do there. But uh, I finally got it collimated and working really well. This is me recording the uh, Venus transit. Uh, I forget what year this was, but uh, uh, I had a cam. I had uh, black and white. Uh, basically uh, uh, security style cameras uh, hooked up to it because that was all there was back then uh, and I was recording it to uh, uh, VHS videotape and uh, 8 millimeter I had an 8 millimeter recorder down here for the camera that I had here and this this one was recording from the finder I mean the uh, guide scope Then a friend of mine uh, bought this telescope down in Florida. It's a 13-inch Dobsonian. <laughs> Brought it home. Had a, he had a, a sedan, and he loaded this in the back seat of his sedan to take it out observing. He had the 10-inch model of this, and he and he had an opportunity to upgrade. He had it for about a month before he realized he just wasn't going to get the use out of it. It was too big. So uh, he offered it to me. I paid him $500 for it. And that's probably the best $500 I spent in a hobby ever. Uh, Parks, I mean, uh, Coulter uh, was, had plate glass mirrors. They weren't th really thick, about an inch, inch and a quarter thick. And they were hit and miss. You know, you'd, you'd have one, you'd have a great mirror, and then you'd have five or six not so great ones. This one has a great mirror. It is one of the best mirrors I've ever seen. Um, I later, because, because if I found something that doesn't take batteries, it soon will. Uh, it's, it's the electrical engineer in me that has, has to do that. So I installed uh, digital encoders on this telescope and it interfaces with my iPad so that it shows me on my astronomy software what my telescope is pointed at. Helps me of course guide the telescope to whatever it was I want to see as well. None of this is motorized. I have to push it, uh, push it to what I want to see but it, it does a wonderful job. I changed the focuser on it, got a really good focuser and then I use uh, a heads-up display type of finder. It's a red dot. Uh, this one's actually green, but it, uh, it, it superimposes a dot on the sky where the telescope is looking, and that's the kind of finder I use. I'll talk about this more in a few minutes, but I don't have a other finder scope on here. I have some very wide field eyepieces that I use, and I'll, I'll put, I'd rather use a very wide field eyepiece in a telescope than a low power finder on the telescope. And then when I want, once I find and center what I want to look at, I'll put the higher magnification eyepieces in and look at it that way. So uh, I left this slide in. This came from another presentation, how to choose a telescope. Aperture, 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 you know, if you want to open a, a restaurant, location, location, location. Uh, telescopes are all about aperture. The, the larger that main front imaging, the front uh, optical element or the mirror in, in a reflector, the more you'll have to work with. The more light you'll gather, the, more, uh, the better resolution you can get out of it. Uh, magnification isn't, isn't all that it might be cracked up to sound like. Uh, it's kind of like the watts in a stereo you, on your car. You, 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 you see advertising for car stereo systems that are a thousand watt or something. You know, okay, maybe. I doubt it seriously. That's probably peak and not RMS, which is RMS watts is what counts, not peak watts and all this other sort of thing. But magnification, you know, 
you take that four and a half inch uh, Tesco telescope I had at first. Uh, on the box, it advertised 900 power, you know? And it probably had, I think it did have a four millimeter eyepiece. It was absolutely useless. You couldn't see anything through it uh, because it far out uh, magnified the useful resolution of the telescope itself. It was just junk. Uh, and that still happens, not as much as it used to, but a lot of less expensive uh, telescopes designed for kids. And, and here's my thing on that. If you're gonna buy your kid, if your kid wants to learn how to play guitar, don't buy him the cheapest guitar out there unless you don't want him to play guitar. They're horrible, they're hard to play, they don't sound good. If you want your kid to play guitar, get them a decent guitar. They're easier to play, they'll sound a lot better, they're more rewarding. Same way with telescopes. You want, to, you want your child to get involved, you want to get involved. Save your money uh, and, and go ahead and invest a little bit. It's a lifelong investment. Uh, I, I have gotten to the point now, I tell anybody that wants to start out in astronomy and they want to pick their first telescope, get an eight inch dot, period, end of statement. That telescope will set up in two minutes. It'll be useful to walk outside. Anytime something comes up, you want to go out and look at it, take it outside, set it down. You'll learn how to point it pretty quickly eventually. And, and you'll have it to look through, and you'll have it the rest of your life to do that with. You want to buy other telescopes? Fine. I don't, I've still got my dot. I wouldn't sell it. It'd be the last one I ever sold. So, uh, help yourself. All right, is bigger always better? Well, yes and no, you know. A friend of mine bought a 20-inch dot a couple of years ago and uh, collimation on it was horrible. And it was hard to get collimated because of the way the secondary was mounted and what have you. And uh, uh, I finally got it collimated for him and a couple of times he took it out to look through it. It was just, uh, you know, all that money and it just wasn't quite there. And then one night the seeing was good and all that uh, regret went away. Um, the atmospheric seeing becomes much more apparent in bigger, and the bigger the telescope is, it's, I'm an electrical engineer, I'm sorry, it's like signal to noise. If you're going to amplify it, everything gets amplified. You need a filter for the noise. You, you've got, to, unfortunately, you're amplifying the noise here too. So you've got to wait for the noise to disappear. All right, mounts. There are two basic style of mounts. I've talked about this earlier. There's the altitude azimuth mount. This is uh, what the dob is. You simply rotate it to whatever compass heading and raise it up, or you just use your finder and go find stuff. Um, if you know your constellations and some stars, which by the way, in the city is easier to do than finding constellations and stuff when you take it out to a dark sky site. That blew me away. And I'd spent years in my driveway finding uh, constellations and stuff. I joined the Memphis Astronomical Society and they got a dark sky observing site. And I go out there and set my telescope up. I get there before dark. You know, I take a compass with me to find north because the North Star is not up yet. And, and I get everything set up and, and suddenly I can't find squat it's there's too many stars and all those bright constellation stars don't stand out like they did back in the city uh, that takes some getting used to and some studying the sky a little better <coughs> there's altitude azimuth which is something like this and then equatorial the trick with equatorial mounts is that one of these, one axis, and as it turns out, it's this one, not this one, needs to be parallel to the rotational axis of the Earth. And that essentially means that this needs to be pointed at the North Star. In fact, 
that's such a useful tip that some of these telescopes actually come with little telescopes mounted in this axis so that you can look through it to see if it's indeed pointed at the North Star. So that's, that's the trick with an equatorial mount. That's why that was so hard for me to grasp at first, I don't know, and I'm hoping I wasn't the only one, but it's possible. <laughs> so uh, then, of course, there are all kinds of, of modern mounts. Uh, this mount on the Schmidt Cassegrain is an altitude azimuth mount. This Cassegrain has got a go-to feature, though, so it can go find objects even using an altitude and azimuth mount. And it can track objects using altitude azimuth. It just has to do both axes at the same time as it moves across the sky. This is, uh, this is showing alt azimuth mounts and how they move. This is an equatorial mount. And the idea, of course, is that this axis is parallel to this one. This is a, uh, a demonstration of how you can take a altitude azimuth fork mount and make it an equatorial by uh, using what's called an equatorial wedge. And most of these kinds of telescopes will have that option available. You can buy a wedge mount for them. Uh, and that way that telescope only has to track in one direction to keep up with what uh, you're looking at. Yes, sir. The North Star no, no. You'll have to find the South Star, and there isn't one. So that becomes a little more tricky. Uh, but you, it's the same thing. Uh, you'll, you'll point it at the same uh, elevation as your latitude and the uh, proper direction for South. And quite honestly, I've never been there. I've never done that. But it's a good question. I'm sure they figured out how to do it. I think you just start off from the Southern Cross to a certain position. Oh, is that? Okay. The Southern Pole. Yeah, cool. We're, we're, we're in the north, Northern Hemisphere. We got lucky. Uh, for only a few more thousand years, though, right? Because the, the Earth, this, this, uh, this axis that we rotate on wobbles. And in 20,000 years, Vega will be the North Star. And in another 20,000 years, it'll come back to Polaris. And uh, uh, it's just uh, it's a large loop. All right. <clears throat> the difference in tracking in one axis with an equatorial mount versus tracking in two axes with an altitude azimuth mount really is only a problem if you're trying to take pictures. Uh, for visual use, who cares if, if Orion looks like this in, this in this hour, and in the next hour it looks like that, and the next hour it looks like this. Who cares, right? But if you're taking pictures, that's not good. So. You, you'll use uh, an equatorial mount to keep track of uh, the image position in the field of view, unless you can afford one with a field rotator that actually takes into account all of this and rotates the camera at the same rate as the image does across the sky. All right. <coughs> Eyepieces. This is the next thing I think that, that new telescope operators will struggle with, and that's eyepieces. And what should I get? It came with one. It might have come with two. Uh, hopefully, it came with a, a wide field eyepiece. Typically, 25 millimeter is, uh, is, comes with almost all the Schmidt Cassegrains, I think. Uh, basically, the things to remember are the smaller the number in millimeters, and they'll, you know, 25, 30, 40 millimeters, the smaller that number is, the higher the magnification, right? The bigger that number is, the, the wider field of view you're going to get. There's, uh, 
by design, by the number of, of elements in the eyepiece and a few other things, those eyepieces can have different fields of apparent fields of view. So you can have a 10 millimeter eyepiece with a 50 degree field of view. That's I think a typical PLOSL is about 50 degrees. And or you can spend a significantly larger amount of money on that 10 millimeter eyepiece and get an 85 or 100 degree field of view. Uh, and it does make a difference. Uh, I've been half blind most of my life. In fact, these are the thinnest glasses I've ever had and that's only because they replaced the lenses in my eyes finally when they fi figured out they couldn't make glasses for me anymore. So, uh, uh, got, and even at that they couldn't correct all of it. So, uh, so I'm not unaccustomed to spending decent money on good glass. I was also an amateur photographer before I got into astronomy and the rule of thumb there was the money goes in the glass. So uh, good eyepieces uh, are, will make the whole thing much better. Uh, eye relief, if you wear glasses, you'll want to look for eyepieces with, that by design have a larger, longer eye relief. You don't have to be as close to the lens to get the full effect of the field of view. Uh, most telescopes anymore have got inch and a quarter diameter um, common fit. I don't know, I'm not sure what that's called. <laughs> it's just the, uh, it's a, they're inch and a quarter diameter mounts. Uh, two inches uh, are, on bigger telescopes, two inch uh, mounts are going to be there. And I think this one actually is a two inch focuser but it's got an adapter for an uh, inch and a quarter eyepiece in it. And that's pretty common. And your better eyepieces are gonna be bigger, heavier, that's something else you gotta consider, and uh, uh, two inch. They, there are actually bigger eyepieces than that. You get into some professional telescopes and you're looking at four inch eyepieces and six inch eyepieces. So these are some of the more common uh, eyepiece manufacturers. There's a whole course that can be done on, uh, on eyepiece uh, designs. Uh, there's Kellners, there's Plossels, there's uh, uh, Nagler's got his whole set of designs, which I happen to love. Then there's Explore Scientific that's got a bunch of good ones. Uh, but there are all kinds of different tele eyepiece designs. Uh, I don't do zoom eyepieces. And, and it, I don't have anything against them except the fundamental idea that they take, to do that, they take more elements of glass. There's some, one of the fundamentals here is every time glass enters and leaves, a, um, every time light enters and leaves a piece of glass, you lose a little bit of it. Every surface, with, as I don't care how clear you think it is, reflects some of the light. And uh, mirrors, for example, uh, I've got the, one of the best mirror coatings on my Dobbs you can get, and it's still only 98% reflective. Uh, most uh, coatings on mirrors are down around 95, some are even less. Um, glass gets coated to be less reflective and uh, allow light to pass through it better. But the more elements you have in an eyepiece, the more it's going to lose. And to make a zoom eyepiece, you've got to have substantially more elements of glass. So I just don't do them. I've got I use multiple eyepieces to do the zoom work. I'll have a 32 millimeter or even a 45 millimeter eyepiece to do the wide field to try to help find what I'm looking for. And then I'll zoom in. And by doing that, I'm, putting, I'm swapping eyepieces at the eyepiece holder down to my four millimeter Nagler sometimes. Most of the time, not. Most of the time, I stop at nine because you pretty much have lost it by the time you get down to four even with a Nagler. Oh. 
finders. Uh, I have, I, when I had the Parkes telescope, I used a finder scope. Uh, that was the only one I ever used a finder scope with. Um, everything else I've ever used, non-magnifying finders. I love the Telrad uh, finder by design. This one is, uh, I, the only problem with these is dew will accumulate on this uh, piece of glass right here. This works like the heads-up display in a fighter jet. Or if you've ever driven a Corvette that had the speedometer display on the windshield, that's the same thing. Um, the, uh, this will put a red dot, or green in my case, and uh, on the sky, and you get that in the general area of what you think you're looking for, and start using the wide field line pieces to find it. Find it. Rigel Systems has one that's very similar. Uh, I've never used it, don't know anything about it. It's the only other one I know that actually works just like this. And then there are these red dot finders like this. These have become quite popular and are very inexpensive and uh, nothing in particular wrong with them. Uh, they're small. They're, they're fine. I, I don't like it as much as I do my tail rat, but you know, I'm old. Change hurts. <laughs> uh, I actually have one of these on my latest toast. Finder scopes. If you have a finder scope, if you want to use a finder scope, um, there's, a, there's a member of our society who's been around for very long that you know, thinks these are just completely useless. A right angle finder scope. Uh, I kind of get where he's coming from. His idea is you use a, a straight through finder scope and you keep both eyes open. I've never been able to do that. I don't care how hard I try. Uh, I had one of these on my parks and the, an important thing if you have this kind of finder I think is having illuminated reticle. All right, you can get them without it. This one doesn't have an illuminated reticle. But if you've got those light crosshairs in a finder, and this finder is lined up with your the equatorial mount so that those crosshairs move with the way the telescope does, then you can use sky charts and what have you to move across the sky using your finder that match that so that the, you stay along that line of travel uh, with those crosshairs. That is quite handy. The other thing I want to say about finders of all types, whether they're uh, reflex finders like the ones we're looking at, or red dots and these, is get them lined up with your telescope. You know, do that in the daylight, do it before you go out, set the telescope up someplace, find something about as far away as you can see through the telescope. Make sure that what you think you're looking at through the telescope is the same thing you're really looking at through the finder. Things like like insulators on power lines, you know, might be the ones above it, or you might not. Be careful. Uh, fence post tips. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, try to make sure that it's the same thing and, and get the telescope, uh, get the finder scope lined up with your main optics uh, telescope. So, finding methods. You know, I've, something somebody said a long time ago basically, if you can't point at it with your finger, you're not going to point at it with a telescope. So. You, you, unless you've got, unless you resort to cheating like I do, which is look up a computer to everything you own so that it <laughs> tells you whether you pointed at it or not. And I really don't care that I can't find it with my finger. Look at the, uh, but uh, get sky charts. In fact, we have some tonight. I want to take a minute to talk about how to read a sky chart. This is a simple, uh, 
whole sky chart. This is for the month of January. And it's, it's just like a road map, except backwards, right? If you, if you hold it up, and this is north, and this is south, then wait a minute, that should be east, and that should be west, but it's not. This is east, and this is west. Because this map is designed to be looked at like this. If you're gonna look to the north and find stuff in the northern sky, you hold north down and look at what's up in here. And you should be able to match what you're seeing in the sky. Same way if I'm looking west, I hold it with west down and look up to see these patterns in the sky. South, same way, and east again. So these are exactly backwards from the road map. But uh, once you learn how to use them, they're pretty, pretty handy. This will help you find the big constellations, the big objects. If you're new to astronomy, uh, trust me, the Messier catalog will keep you busy till you're not new to astronomy anymore. <laughs> so uh, uh, get you something that's got the M, the M numbers on it, Messier objects. You go find those. Uh, the first handful are globular clusters, then they go to uh, nebula, which are big clouds of gas of some sort or another. Some of them are dead star remnants. Some of them are just big clouds of gas. And then you get into the real faint fuzzies where you start to look at other galaxies outside of our own. In fact, on the back of each one of these is a list of things you might want to look at in the month of January. Please help yourself to these. We have enough for everybody. Thank you, Steve, for creating our So, use the star chart, find it, what it is you want to look at. And as I've mentioned before, I use wide field eyepiece. Uh, you can use your finder, you can use your heads up display, point at that red dot pointed in roughly the spot in the sky that seems to match that spot on the chart, and then start using the wide field eyepiece to look at it. Once you start to see that faint, fuzzy thing that you thought you were looking for show up in the field of view, change into a higher magnification eyepiece. Then there are a lot of telescopes like the one Ann's got here that have go to capabilities. They have different setup requirements. Uh, I've got one at home that you sit down, turn it on, give it about 30 minutes, and you come back and it knows exactly where it's at and what the point is. Um, to, to, for a telescope to be automated like that, it has to know three things. What time it is, where exactly it is on the planet, and what direction is north. A GPS will tell you what time it is and where exactly it's located. But the GPS will not tell you which direction is north. You need a compass for that. So a lot of these will have GPS built into them but may not have an electronic compass, those you typically sit down, start up, let them get organized, and then you've got to point it at the North Star. And that'll set to where the North is. And from there, you can go start finding other things. There are various uh, steps to go through to get to all that. Celestron seems to have their set, their way of doing it. Me has their way. Uh, I'm pretty good with me telescopes. Freddie's really good with Celestron. Um, come to observing session. We'll help you figure those out. Uh, you know what I didn't put in here? I didn't put in a picture of Stellini. And, and they actually make telescopes now that you just sit down, turn it on, get your iPhone out, connect to it, and tell it what to look at, and it does. And you don't have to know squat. You don't have to know zip. You've got to have big pockets. But you don't have to know. <laughs> so Lena, I think it's four grand. What's the EV scope? Three. Three. So, uh, you know, there. Give me two grand, I'll show you. Yeah. That, you know, uh, there. 
they're amazingly good. I was really skeptical when they first came out. I thought, yeah, I get it. They got something that'll point in the right direction. They're going to pull pictures off the internet and show you. <laughs> right. And they're amazing. And the pictures they do are amazing. I was, I am duly impressed. The MAS has one on one that we take to public events. We'll take a uh, flat panel TV out, run it off the battery, and uh, show people, uh, show a crowd what they're looking at. And the beauty of that is they're not standing in line at a tele but trying to get a view to the next available eyepiece. And that's really handy when they've got kids. So um, Boy Scout troops, that sort of thing, uh, this is really a miracle for that, uh, that type of outreach. Software assisted. So uh, the parks telescope I had, I put the colors on, and I used a, a computer to help me find what I was looking for. My 13-inch uh, dog. Y'all saw my y'all saw my iPad mounted to it. Uh, I just I, I I just I just do. I can. I know how to do this, so I do it. And. Uh, Bill Buster will turn in his grave every time I say that, but uh, I don't care that I can't go out and point my finger at everything up in the sky. I don't have to know that. I cheat. All right. A very handy tool for observing. Oh, it's a good pair of binoculars. I don't care what methods you're using to find things. This is a great way to survey the sky and see what you want to look at. Uh, get you closer to what you're trying to point your telescope at. 50 millimeter for, for astronomical binoculars. Something that's 50 millimeter or bigger. Um, and 50 spine, 70 is okay. I've got some 80s. <laughs> but you can't handhold anything much bigger than about seven or 10 X power. So I have a pair of seven by 50s that I use for finding things. I've got a pair of 20 by 80, and it's 20 times magnification, 80 millimeter objectives that I mount on a mount that sits on the table and looks at a mirror that looks at the sky. So I don't have to crane my neck back like this and look through them or hold them up. I just sit on the table and look through them and move the mirror up to what I want to see. Uh, they don't make that adapter anymore, which I think is sad, but it was well done. <laughs> um, this, is, this is a minor thing, but uh, the type of glass they use in uh, astronomy-related uh, binoculars in the prisms makes a difference. Uh, BAK-4 passes a lot more light than BK-7 does. So if you're buying uh, binoculars for astronomy, try to make sure that they have BAK-4 prisms. So, okay, so All right. So you've got your telescope, you figured out how to use it, and now you found something and it still looks like a So what do you do? Well, there are lots of reasons for things to not look good uh, through a telescope. We talked about some of the aberrations, chromatic aberration that occurs in uh, refractors. You know, you're going to see that mostly when you look at something really bright with a, refra with a refractor. Uh, bright star Vega, some of the, you know, maybe. Uh, uh, Anyway, bright stars are going to are going to have halos. They're going to have uh, uh, may actually see the separate colored rings, depending on how short the focal length of your uh, acromat is. Um, the better telescopes won't, that won't be as bad, but you can still get halos on uh, bright stars. Catadioptrics can suffer the effects. Uh, I mean, reflectors, except for the catadioptrics can suffer the effects of the central image, uh, the, the mirror in the middle of the field of view. Uh, and like I said, they, they, 
in most test grains, most street test grains, maxitabs are typically not really a big problem. You get into something like a rich accretion or some telescope that's designed specifically for astroimaging, and it becomes really a problem. They, uh, uh, the, the, the image becomes blush. So, uh, comma, uh, in classical cast grains, a lot of the older Schmidt cast grains had coma. Uh, they have, they have, me and Celestron both uh, have coma free Schmidt cast grains anymore. They've tried to call them rich accretions for a little while, and somebody sued them over that. They're not really rich accretions, they're corrected. Um, Schmidt Cassie grains, and uh, so now they just call it coma free. Uh, uh, that one I suspect is. Then diffraction spikes, of course, I talked about those, and whether they're a problem or not is up to you. Uh, collimation, uh, that's one that, that uh, there's a whole other presentation on. I will tell you about, uh, I think it's, yeah. No, it's, all right, so one of the ways to know if your telescope is the cause of the problem is to look at what you're looking at, a bright star out of focus, right? Try to find a bright star, you go plus focus, minus focus. It should create a fuzzy blob of concentric rings and the sharper those rings are, and the smaller the central obstruction is, and the more round they are, it tells you that you're doing pretty good. You know? If the center is off in one direction from the outside, then it's likely a collimation issue. The primary mirror is not pointed exactly where it needs to be, or the secondary mirror is not. If the if the uh, if, the, if those airy discs go from uh, oblong this way to oblong this way on either side of focus, that's astigmatism. And that can be mostly, most of the times I've found that it's due to a pinched secondary mirror. I've seen it in a pinched primary. And I also have an eyepiece that has astigmatism. <laughs> that one. That one wore me out trying to fix my telescope before I realized it was the eyepiece. And, and it's a shame, too. It's one of my favorite eyepieces. A big old honking 32 millimeter Erfel design cheap. Uh, field curvature is horrible. You, you feel like you're drunk and you stand across the sky and everything's moving across the sphere. Kind of like those images of, of a black hole moving in front of something. You know? and just, uh, uh, but it's a great finder. You know, it's, uh, it's it helps. I can find something with a heartbeat with that thing. Uh, uh, pinch optics and sequences. Okay. But learning how to read the, those, those out of focus star images will tell you what kind of shape your telescope's in. Most tall, uh, 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 turbulent. Outside edges, when you get out of focus, outside edges just wiggling around and stuff. It's typically, typically, uh, boundary layer turbulence at your mirror. The telescope hasn't completely cooled down, the mirror is not the same temperature as the outside air, and that boundary layer where that air is changing, where the temperature is changing between outside air and the front surface of the mirror, that's just churning uh, air right there. And that'll cause those squiggles. And you get much the same effect with the atmosphere. And so sometimes determining whether the churning is your telescope's not cool, that's something you'll figure out by, well, okay, I just got here, I just set it up, I carried it in the trunk of my car where it was really hot to get here, yada yada. So that or it's been out here all night and it's still that way, it's not your mirror, it's the atmosphere. So and that's what I want to talk about next, are the non-telescopic obstructions. Those gremlins trying to keep you from enjoying your telescope. 
So the atmospheric sea, uh, there's actually some websites that will tell you what the scene should be right now or in the future, in the near future. Uh, this is what it looks like when the atmosphere is turning and you're trying to look at a crater on the moon. Uh, this is essentially what happens, the atmosphere. Uh, light coming through our atmosphere is refracted in it like lenses and hot pockets of air, cold pockets of air are moving up and down all the time like boiling water and that's what causes the uh, turbulence in the light. Local conditions can emulate the same thing. Taking a telescope out and sitting it on a hot driveway is just a good place to have after it gets dark and cool. Just have all that heat radiating back up off the driveway. Uh, it's just going to be more churning. It's that stuff you, that you see along the long garage way, uh, way off. Uh, asphalt is worse than concrete because it stores more energy because it's black. So uh, get that a lot. Uh, gravel's not so bad. Uh, and then try to look back over the hood of your car. I found that one out the hard <laughs> way. Well, I just set up, you're in the grass, everything's bright. You go look at something and suddenly everything's just horrible. And you go, ah, my truck's sitting right there. So uh, be mindful of that. Uh, Temperature stabilizations, of course, I just talked about the, uh, temp the stabilizing the temperature of the glass. Um, you know, I, I, my 13 inch dial, I basically take it out, set it up, and don't expect to really look through it for at least an hour. An hour later, the imaging is going to be so much better than it is when I first set it up. The mirror finally stabilizes and it's sharp. Uh, there's a couple of websites. We have on our website uh, a weather uh, uh, page. It's got a lot of links to weather forecasts. A lot of those are astronomy specific. We'll have uh, metrics like what the sea is supposed to be. Uh, you get that. There's several things to look at there. Transparency and sea. Uh, transparency has a lot to do with how much water vapor is in the air. That will impact your ability to see, especially in a light polluted area. That's another thing we'll talk about is light pollution. But that light that's reflected back down, that's coming off the city, it's reflected back down on us, is doing so on most of the water vapor. If it was really, really dry, you'd have a lot less of it. So uh, light pollution can be worse by high uh, water vapor content transparency with conservation. Light pollution is just bad. Uh, when I started this, and uh, I mean, I, Bill Bustler talks about being able to see stuff from the, back in the 50s from Midtown, you know, and, and when I started this, I lived up on Shady Grove Road uh, and, and could see decent it wasn't bad for that parts 10 inch. It really wasn't bad. Now it's horrible. And uh, it's just in 30 years I've been doing this. So uh, light pollution's gotten bad. It's going to get worse before it gets better. And you can help. So feel so inclined. Uh, try to get active with the International Dark Sky Association. Help champion things like uh, lighting laws that will uh, hopefully get rid of unprotected light sources. This is the best. This is called a full cutoff fixture. People don't realize it, but if you go outside and you've got exposed light fixtures, and, and there, there, are a lot, there are lots of them right across the street over here, uh, it's it's terrible, especially when you're down low because. It, it closes down the iris of your eye, and you can't see what else is out there in the dark. Uh, you know, if everything was full cut off, it wouldn't be as bright, but your eyes would open up, and you could see all the dark places. So, uh, 
that's it as far as presentation goes. Those of you that brought telescopes and want some advice or coaching, uh, uh oh. Yeah, uh, Council moved in. We thought we were going to go outside and look, but it looks like a cloud. I'd go try. Uh, I'd go try if you were. Yeah, we might only we we still see the drive. Drive. <laughs> There might be something <laughs> off to, we still see the to the east. You can see. Uh, Mars versus Mars. And the moon uh, probably which, still which comes through. Which one are you using? Uh, that's, that's the, so anyway, thank late. you very much. I hope I've given you something to do this. And uh, oh, okay. stick around if you want to look at your telescope and see if you can figure it out. All right, that's it. We're just going to end the meeting now. It's uh, pushing 9 o'clock. So again, if you have a telescope and you either want to bring it out or have Rick or, or someone else take a look, we'll just kind of open it up. Thanks for coming. All right.